Welcome to the Live Well, Perform Better podcast. My name is David Duggan and I'm the director of Below the Line, an Irish-based consultancy specialising in helping people, teams and organisations raise their levels of consciousness, inner potential and performance. I am part of a team made up of experts from the worlds of business, elite sport, adventure and health and well-being. We are coaches, mentors and advisors to some of the world's biggest companies and organisations, as well as smaller businesses, entrepreneurs and people looking to make their mark in the world. Our guiding mantra at Below the Line is live well and perform better. What does that mean, you might ask? Good question. Maybe the easiest way to describe it from our perspective is finding the formula that works for you when it comes to things like looking after your physical and mental health, running your business, developing your career, leading your people, or simply being able to show up as brilliantly as possible into your own life, both for yourself and those around you. That's why each week I sit down with a member of our team or an invited guest for a conversation that focuses on the question, what do the words live well, perform better mean to you? This question is a way into exploring with people from a range of different backgrounds, industries and disciplines. What are the practices, techniques, habits or ideas that they use to help them to show up and be at their best in all areas of their lives? whether that's as CEOs, leaders or managers, or as parents, family members or friends. We keep it short and sweet so that you can extract all the good stuff and get on with the rest of your day and hopefully put some of our knowledge, experience and expertise into play for yourself. This week I'm delighted to have been joined by another very special guest, John Toohey. John was the CEO and founder of Parcel Motel, a hugely successful parcel locker business which was acquired by UPS in 2017. An award-winning and experienced leader in the parcel delivery and logistics industry, John sat down with me to talk about his career to date and what he has learned from his experiences building businesses and teams in a career that has had many twists and turns and is far from over yet. Along the way, we covered everything from his new venture, Upod, and returning to the world of a startup after building up a large business, the importance of looking after yourself when in the middle of pressurised situations, as well as why Ireland is a great country to do business in in 2023. You can subscribe at www.belowtheline.ie where you can stay up to date with our podcast as well as our exclusive online events and sessions, including our Press Pause coaching community. Thanks for listening, and now, on with the show. Okay, great. Well, look, I'll, I'll start by saying, first of all, John, thanks a million for joining me. I know uh, you're extremely busy, so I appreciate you giving me my, your, your time. Um, and I was going to start with the first question I, I always ask our guests, which is just tell me, tell me, why do you do what you do? And my reason for asking that one is it usually gives us a good insight into a little bit of your background and your story, as well as what you're up to right now and some of the mo- motivations behind that. Why we do what we do is just, you know, when you see, you see, you see a gap or you see a need in the market and you think, uh, you know, that you, you can create something exciting and add value um, and um, have some fun along the way. And obviously as well to to uh, to make a living, you know, um, where, <laughs> you know, so that helps as well. So look, it, it helps if you do something you really like and uh, and uh, that you, 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 you get paid for it as well. And I suppose it, I was only having this conversation with my son recently, who's a musician. He's a he's in a fifth year student at school still. He's a very talented musician, and um, he played a he plays the occasional paid gig. You know, we were having this conversation about you know uh, how how he really he's doing something he really loves doing, and to get paid for it as well. That's a really added bonus, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as I understand it from knowing like a small amount of your story, but you're a you're a, almost a serial entrepreneur in the in, in the parcel business. But is that something you kind of you stumbled into or was that something that it found you or how how would you describe your your, your own path or journey? Um, no, in the parcels business, I um, I start my career in parcels basically as a van driver in Dublin in the in the 1980s and um I progressed I went to work for a multinational and progressed through the ranks there uh, to to management and then into senior management at quite a young age so when I was when I was 20, 20 oh god 20 20 or 21 I was in a senior management position there 
And uh, so it, it, it that was my sort of career mapped out. And then the, the company I was working for sort of had a reorg of their business in Europe. And I actually um, had a, uh, yeah, it was made redundant. So uh, we left the business. And, but it was, I'd have to say, it was very generous redundancy for, for a 21 year old because I was in a senior management position. So my pay grade, uh, the severance package that I got with the pay grade I was on was was fantastic, and the company were really good uh, about the uh, exit. They they made sure that we had you know that everyone anyone leaving the business had whatever resources they needed to with their career and so on. And that was in that was in nineteen ninety two, and things were pretty bleak in Ireland in nineteen ninety two. Um, we just come out of the eighties. The government at the time was doing everything they could to try and stimulate the economy in Ireland. And it was only really at the start of multinationals, multinational manufacturing arriving in Ireland. And so the choices after I left, after I left that business, uh, the, the choices for me really were either to emigrate or to um, start a business. So, and I actually just bought my first house in Dublin at the time. And people talk about interest rates going up now, because I remember interest rates in 1992 at one point hitting, I think, 19% on, on August. So it wasn't, you know, the economy was sort of a sputtering to a, to a start, I think, in the early 90s. So we, I decided, you know, with, uh, stay put and have a go start the business. I could see the, the company that was that I had worked for that were leaving, the, uh, leaving Ireland at the time. We're leaving a couple of leaving a number of clients behind that were uh, had no service basically, so uh, and had a requirement. So there was a, the ingredients there of a, of a business, a small business. So myself, Dave, uh, who was also uh, Dave Field, who was also a manager in the same company, uh, founded Nightline at the time, and and we started out working out a spare bedroom in my house and built that business up from the two of us, two little vans and a mobile phone. Uh, up to a really big business then by the time we sold it um, exactly 25 years to the day later we started it on the 3rd of May 1992 and we signed a contract to sell it to UPS on the 3rd of May 2017 so it's a 25 year journey so um, I suppose that's how I ended up in the Paris delivery business so started as a van driver just got hooked up hooked in the business and then when we started Nightline then we we I, saw, I suppose we uh, expanded that into various areas of business and we had a number of trading divisions there including parcel motel that a lot of people would be familiar with um, by the time we sold in 2017 we had sort of five different trading divisions it was all under the one roof of the same company you know yeah yeah wow what a success story what an amazing story um, and just reflecting on your your kind of fast rise in in the first job that you had uh, was that with fedex am i right in saying that fedex yeah yeah, yeah 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 so what do you think it was that helped you rise through the ranks into senior management so quickly uh i just i was just a very hard working and a deadly earnest individual and work was my 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 career and work were really my priority at the time so i would have to say if you sliced, uh, people often say if you just sliced me down the middle um, during my time in FedEx, I'd have been orange on one side and purple on the other. Really, really was it very my career and my career with FedEx were really my priority and had very little else in my life. I have to say, would have been quite a, quite a deadly earnest individual. Probably not very interesting because all I really talked about was work and thought about was work at the time. So I suppose if you put that much time and effort and thought into your into your job and your career, then uh, it pays off in terms of escalating your career through promotion uh, over time, you know. So that, that's all it was, really. It was just I was a, a workaholic, probably still am, uh, truth be told. But I gave up uh, gave up using that expression a few years ago and said, well, I actually, I'm actually enjoying what I do. So I'm, I'm, I've, I've sort of submitted myself to that to that concept, I suppose, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And would you say there was something in your family background that, you know, you had a strong work work ethic or was it something something else? Uh, I don't think so. To be, to be honest, I mean, um, my father was a very hard working man. He died when I was when I was a boy. Um, he had a he, he just dropped out of a heart attack one day and um, he was a very hard working guy, but he wasn't particularly entrepreneurial. He had a he had a he had a jo- the same job. Um, my my parents went to London in the nineteen fifties, like a lot of people would have done. Uh, my father's first cousin uh, was 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 becoming a successful entrepreneur in Ireland in the nineteen early nineteen sixties. He was a 
he was a, a property developer and owned a, owns some pubs and betting betting offices and things like that. So my father uh, had a, had a reasonably good education and came back from London to work with his cousin to help him run his business. And that's that's pretty much what he did until he until he died when he was fifty two, in nineteen eighty. So, but he, while he was quite hard working, um, he 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 wasn't a risk taker. So I, I don't I don't think you know that there was any kind of an entrepreneurial streak there in him. Mind you, he had six kids, so he probably felt he had a bit of responsibility, you know. Whereas my mother, on the other hand, uh, who's who is uh, still alive, um, she would have been very much uh, a goer. I would have been a bit more of a risk taker, and I think in a different era probably would have been a successful businesswoman in her own right, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's a mixture of things there, I suppose. The work, work, I suppose work, I was never afraid of hard work and hard work. It's true what they say, hard work does pay off, you know. If you work hard enough at something and you, you have a dream or a vision and you work hard enough to to achieve your goals, the chances are you'll be successful, you know. And in terms of Upod now, what is it exactly and how does it differ from, say, something like Parcel Motel, which you were involved with previously? But uh, it's a really interesting concept from what I've heard about it. Yeah, I mean, when I when I left, uh, when we sold um, Nightline, the Nightline group, which included Parcel Motel, um, I had a number of ideas for, for Parcel Motel that I hadn't quite gotten around to sort of executing before we sold the business to UPS. And what Upod really is, is... is is a, is is an open and agnostic network of of self service lockers. Now, we often use the term parcel lockers, but at the but actually they're good for anything. So if you wanted to, if they can for if somebody just wanted to leave their keys off for their Airbnb or anything like that. So it's not necessarily not necessarily just about parcels, albeit that parcels are a big part of our business. All right. So parcel Upoders, it's a network of parcel lockers that we're expanding. Um, as fast as we can and what it is is it's an open and agnostic system that's open to all couriers to use all merchants and all all consumers as a self-service uh, system and i suppose um parcel lockers and parcel locker networks are becoming um quite trendy in europe now and there's a lot, a lot of capital chase in that market in europe and really, that's because there's a there's a few things happening on the regulatory side. The EU are handing down directives to to governments to um, to improve air quality in cities in particular, and uh, so UPOD uh, really feeds into the sustainability agenda from the point of view that we're making we want to bring parcel delivery of items delivered or bought online to a more centralized points so that to take commercial vehicles off residential streets and, and therefore imp hopefully improve air quality and reduce the amount of noise and pollution and so on on residential streets caused by delivery of, of um, items bought online. And then it, so that's the, the kind of regular side of it is there's a there's a push towards consolidation of what we call the final mile in parcel delivery. We're also helping couriers reduce their costs by consolidating deliveries into a central point. So, so a, a courier can bring, you know, deliver 10 parcels to a locker bank instead of having to go to 10 individual homes with deliveries. And we're just, and we're also helping to hopefully making things more convenient for consumers as well. And there's, there's, a, I was speaking to a colleague in Estonia there last week, and he was telling me that right now there's, uh, 120 parcel lockers, self-service parcel locker networks in the EU, um, just like Upod. So we're following a trend, a European trend. Um, I suppose we're seeing what's happening in other markets where there's probably where where they might be more advanced than this type of thing. And um, and then we're also looking at the UK market where there's already a very well established market in the UK for what we call pudos, which is pick up drop off points. That'll be your corner store where you you arrange to have your parcel to drop it off at the corner store if you're returning or sending something or pick up the parcel that your courier is delivering there. So that's already a very well established uh, business practice in the UK, much more so than in Ireland. And uh, in the UK, we're addressing an established market where the, the market is looking for more capacity in that space, what we call the out of home space. That's where the OOH comes from. Uh, and, um, so out of home is a very well established business practice in the UK. 
that's looking for more capacity and more automation in the space. So that's what we're doing in the UK. And then in the Ireland, in the UK, we're addressing an established market, participate in it. In Ireland, we're establishing a market, shall we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, very exciting. Um, the other thing I remember, again, from hearing you speak um, late last year was, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, allowing people to be able to get prescriptions. So there was, uh, there's specific types of U-pods for that. And so that, that sounded really interesting to me um, and very practical uh, application of your technology. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, I can turn the, the camera around here and you'll see over in the corner here, we have a variety of parcel lockers here, right? So the ones down in the corner, the green one in particular, they're, they're designed for, for, they were designed by a, a Finnish manufacturer for, um, for use in pharmacies, they're spe specially designed for use with for pres prescribed medications. So you could automate the, the process of picking up um, a prescription in the pharmacy, and it's got all sorts of all the software in the background's got all sorts of auditing capabilities, and the machine the machines themselves have temperature measuring and all the rest of it. Um, we've kind of sort of hit a hit a bit of a sort of a snag in Ireland in that the regulatory environment in Ireland is very very tight and um the chemists the pharmacies that we're talking to that we've all been talking to are really worried that um uh, by using this type of technology that they might be breaching um existing uh, regulations in ireland for the for for the dispensing of prescribed medication and the handover of the medication to the patients so look that's something that i think will evolve in time because i, don't, I think it's only a matter of time before the rules and regulations and have to catch up with what people really need to do on the ground and that's more to automate the processes and in automate low value add um repetitive processes in uh, in the pharmacy so look it's a, it's we're, we've got a longer journey ahead of us there because at the end of the day we're we're our customers in this will be the pharmacies themselves and it's for the pharmacies really to make sure that they're compliant with with the regulations that are in play I'd have to say though that in the UK, where we're also um, we're also marketing that product, the the regulatory environment is much is is much more progressive, and much more welcoming of of this type of technology. So the, we're thinking that the UK is probably the the next you know the UK is a more attractive market for us now. There's lower hanging fruit there than there is in Ireland for the time being, albeit that I think the Irish market will catch up in time, because we tend to lag the UK in in terms of these kinds of trends. And eventually, what, what you see happening in the UK eventually happens in Ireland. And then just while we're on the, the tour around here, over there, then you'll see um, these lockers here with the glass doors on them are actually hot hot food lockers that we've just got in from our um, supplier in China. This will be where you'll go when you go to you know, your service station and you can order your food in advance on an app or on our website. And then they'll, the hot, they'll have it ready in a hot food locker for you to pick up rather than go and go into the store and queue up. So it's great that they have an app that you can order your food, but then you still have to go in the store at lunchtime and get in a queue with everybody else or in that type of environment. So I suppose our overall mantra is to try and introduce automation and self-service to aspects of life where it does not already exist and uh, to try and help, help businesses reduce their costs save time and to make provide more convenience for for customers you know yeah yeah it's fascinating um it also seems to me uh, going back to what you said earlier about this uh, the word agnostic to me that conjures up this idea of well you know it's just a box right so it can be used in a variety of ways so it's how creatively how, how excuse me how creatively can you use those that box or that idea or that technology and it seems to me that you're you're really embracing kind of that uh, open-ended way of looking at it yeah exactly i mean um there's a there's a parcel locker network um in a, in a very similar business model to ours in california and um eric levy the ceo of that of that parcel locker business i think sums it up very well and he says look you know when the iphone came along um, it was an open piece of architecture and people um, people could design different apps to do different things that sat on the iPhone. So with our parcel locker, with our UPod parcel lockers, what we're trying to do here is create an as open as possible piece of arc of infrastructure that's uh, accessible, tech-wise tech, tech -wise accessible through an open API or, you know, a public API. And then it's for businesses, consumers, entrepreneurs, whatever, to come up with the ideas in terms of how they how to use that. 
that uh, infrastructure. So for us, it's really about you know providing the infrastructure, providing the ease of access, and then for for our customers, whether they be small businesses, consumers, or large enterprises, to use as they wish. You know. And interestingly enough, even though Paris Motel, even though UPS bought Paris Motel in twenty seventeen, they've now decided to close down Paris Motel and they're trans transferring their parcel locker business over to UPod because they think it's a it's a much better way for them to go because it takes them out of the ownership and operation of a parcel locker network, which is an expensive business to be in, just to own your own private parcel locker network, and just to you go you switch over to us on to, on a pay as you go basis. So they're. They're actually one of our first major clients uh, in terms of um, big uh, courier companies that are have signed up to use the use Upad. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of you know building a business and maybe trying to bring a team around you, what are some of the challenges that you found associated with that? Because obviously you've done this a couple of times now. When, when you got when we got to a point of you know 20, 20 plus years at Nightline, and if we had a new business idea or a new business initiative. We had a we had a team around us there where we could we had IT people we had finance people we had you know all of the resources we needed to try new ideas, so to actually start a business from scratch as in a startup with no resources and knowing that you can shout out the door and say listen can you you know run a few numbers on a spreadsheet or whatever, it is quite challenging no doubt about it, but look um Orla Shields who was the C she was the general manager at Paris Motel and uh, we worked together for the uh, best part of 20 years at at, at um, Paris Motel and Nightline. Uh, she's joined me on the team here as my COO, so that's great because we've I've got real expertise in terms of uh, how operating a Paris Locker Network. And then uh, I've got uh, Simon Jolie, who's my operations director, is um, former Virgin Media um he was formerly at Virgin Media, where he was a customer of ours, actually at Nightline and Paris Motel. And he was a great man for, for challenging us with new ideas and so on. So he's on my operations, he's my operations director here. So really, uh, then I have a great IT team um, in, in Patrick and Catherine Crean. They're actually a husband and wife operation and they have a um, they have a, an outsourced IT business, a digital also specializing in digital media. So um they're really doing a great job in terms of the application development and also supporting us on the digital media side of things as well on our social media ch uh, channels and on our Google search and everything else. So we've got quite a small team. They're not all dedicated. They have other, you know, they have other lines of business as well and so on. So they're not just dedicated to here, but everybody's just so excited about the opportunity here and um, we see the growth now in terms of our subscriber growth is, is, in, is, in, is growing every day in terms of consumer subscribers we're rolling out more locations all the time and um, we've reached agreement with with Lidl which we're really ex excited about so to place a parcel locker uh, one of our UPOD lockers at each, every Lidl store in Ireland and Northern Ireland so we're, we're really starting to gain momentum now and I think people are starting to get a bit more familiar with the brand and how it works and what it's all about so uh, it's 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 really good, and uh, you know we've had a lot, so much goodwill shown towards us from the logistics industry, from on post, and from you know from Amazon and all of the guys, the, all of the major couriers, um, GLS and so on. All the major couriers are, are really really excited about this because they can see it as a as a, a a future part of the of their service offering to to their to their customers, you know. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and in terms of you know you and uh, in the middle of all of that, you know, how do you find time to look after yourself? Uh, you know, in, indulge in any hobbies? Maybe you can't, but I'm just wondering, are there any practices or things you do to help yourself? Um, yeah, do you know what? Um, I when I left when I left Nightline, I was a seriously unhealthy. I was very overweight and um. And I was just um, quite very stressed out. 20, 25 years of building a business that we started with 10 grand and built it up to, you know, 65 million in turnover and over one over 1,200 employees. So it was a great, de de it was a, it was the great decompression. Once I sold, once I sold the business, I, I, I made a promise to myself to just do nothing for a year, which I pretty much did. So one of the things I, some of the well, one of the few things I did there was I took up just wanted to get fit and lose some weight and start you know just live a little bit more healthily, and I 
started just walking every morning and then I kind of got a little bit bored with that. So then I I I I, I uh, bit the bullet and went and bought a bicycle. I hadn't ridden a bike probably since I was in primary school. So I took up cycling in 2017, 2018. And I just, I really liked it, really enjoyed the early morning cycle. And, you know, especially at this time of year and all the rest of it. And I'd have to say, you know, then COVID came, habits changed, you know. And let's just say, while I, you know, I'll, while I'm in better shape than I was, say, a few years ago, I won't be making the front cover of men's health anytime soon. But um, but I'm so I'm threatening now to to get the bike back out of the shed now that spring has come again and get it cleaned up and get it oiled because uh, that those just I just find um early morning exercise and I, I I'm not naturally an early morning person to be honest with you I I have to force myself to go to bed early and get out of bed early in the morning and either get a walk in or a cycle in and I just find you know, motivating yourself to get out and do a cycle in the morning or a 20 kilometer cycle or whatever it is, you know, is, is, can be challenging, but you never regret doing it once you, once you get back and finish and you have that bit of exercise out of the way for the day. So I really enjoy that. And then I, other things I like, I just, I really love music. So I'd be listening to music as much as I can in my car. And I, I like to catch up on books, but I, I get, I have such a backlog of books that a friend of mine recommended I started listening to audio books. So, I'm I'm doing that now, which is great. So I I, I catch up uh, when, especially on a long journey, I love to stick a book on and and listen to it in the car. So that's they're the kind of things I do. And of course, I've um you know I've I've cracked that joke probably when I met you at the Dublin Chamber when I you know after I sold the company in 2017, I went home to my house and I found there was three people living in it. It turned out it was the, my wife and kids, you know, and uh, so it was great getting to get to be able to spend some time with them. And um, you know, it's it's just so important to you know because life just goes by so fast. You know when you know you know nowadays when your your phone, your Google Photos or whatever pops up in your phone and shows you this time ten years ago. And when I look at photos of my kids when they were little kids and all that, I just I often say and say to my wife as well. I just say, where has that time gone? You know, it just goes by so fast. So you really have to try and enjoy it and uh, be in the moment for as much as you can. Very difficult for an entrepreneur, though, and for people that are busy in business. I appreciate that, but it's one thing that I try and do more, try and do better, shall we say, you know. I get the sense from you, um, you really feel that there is real momentum behind what you're doing, but you really enjoy it and you, you love it. But what is the most fun aspect of uh, of running a business like yours? I suppose, um, the re- I suppose when you see that people, I suppose when you see when you have customer, when you, when you actually customers, when customers come on board and pay to use your service so that's that's kind of proof that you're delivering something to the market that people want or need and um and that's that it's not just a dream in your head so when you when you see that people and then people are people compliment us about the service or give us feedback and all the rest of it it's just such a joy and i mean where i'm where i'm sitting right now um my i'm looking out onto the car park of our office here in santry we actually have a parcel locker in the car park here for for members of the public to use, and it's just such a thrill when I when I'm sitting there when I look up and I see somebody uh, just as well while we've been talking here now I saw a woman pull up and pick up a parcel from the locker, and it's just I thought oh it's just one of those it's just one of those silly things that it's always a, I don't know if the novelty will ever wear off to actually see customers engaging with our with our lockers and using them, and you know and clearly we've designed them well and might our IT guys and our team have done such a great job that they're so easy to use that people can just rock up and um, key their code in and pick up their package or drop off a package for UPS or whatever it might be. So it's a real thrill in that. And I think business people and entrepreneurs will 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 understand what I'm saying there, that to see your customers engaging with your service and, um, and, and getting that positive feedback and seeing them coming back for more it's just such a thrill, you know. What do you see as being some the the economic outlook or the or the future holding for for Ireland Irish businesses, etc.? I think we're I think we're doing so well in Ireland. I really do. I mean, as somebody that's lived lived through the eighties, uh, I mean, when I when I was in secondary school in the eighties, uh, the career career guidance teacher used to come into our class once a month to um, do a, a lesson specifically uh, to uh, set, to to um, set us up for a long-term unemployment, you know, to prepare us for long-term unemployment, you know. 
So it was such a bleak place, Ireland in the eighties. And anybody, I'm fifty four now. Anybody that came through the education system in the eighties will understand that uh, we we were in we were uh, a basket case of an economy. And if you look around Dublin now, I, I mean, I live in Dublin. I'm not biased towards Dublin by any means. Look around Dublin. I was in Cork last weekend, and you see driving into Cork now. I mean, the city almost has a skyline now in terms of all the new development and all the rest of it. It's just we we have so much to offer now. I mean, and when I was involved with, uh, when I was had not, in Nightline back in 2017, I was involved in the Junior Entrepreneur Programme with Jerry Kennelly, who was a fantastic entrepreneur from County Kerry. And he set up this Junior Entrepreneur Programme in primary schools and he um, occasionally asked entrepreneurs like me to go into the schools and work with the kids and do little Dragon's Den kind of competitions, that kind of stuff. And just uh, to see a, a fifth class student uh, stand up and do a PowerPoint presentation, a business presentation. I mean, it was just we really unheard of in my day. And I was just, I, you know, it always was so assuring to think like the country really is in, in great hands in terms of the young people that we have coming through now and all the rest of it. So I don't think we've got anything to worry about, to be honest with you. Look, we might see a bit of a, a bit of a pullback. I can see, I know that in the tech sector, there's been a bit of a, you know, a bit of a softening up there. And we've got our problems like with, you know, with housing and all the rest of it, but so is everyone else. And um, I, I just think we're in such great shape in Ireland. If we can, if we can tackle the accommodation problem and, um, you know, really, you know, that's probably the, the highest priority now. And, um, and tackle, you know, honestly, tackle homelessness. Dublin's a small city. It's only 1.3 million people. It's not Los Angeles. That's something we really need to get on top of. But I think these are not insurmountable problems. And I think generally speaking, and despite it not really been what we wanted, but I think Brexit, dare I say it, has been good for Ireland in terms of FDI and it's brought uh, more investment into the country and all the rest of it. So look, I think we're in great shape. I think Ireland's in, and I know the world is heading into this sort of recessionary headwinds now. But look, cycles come and go. Recession comes, boom comes. After boom comes bust. It's it's you know you can see this the cracks are starting to show on the banking sort of sector now with SVB and all the rest of it, but look it's not something that's going to stop the world from turning. We'll all be st- still be here this time next year, you know. Yeah, 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 fantastic. And then lastly, for anyone listening to this, um, uh, where can they find you, or what's the best way to get in touch with you about a, a locker, whether that's um, any, anyone trying to reach me personally is LinkedIn is best. So um, if they could search me on LinkedIn, uh, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm quite active on LinkedIn most days and uh, for the business upod.com O-O-H-B-O-D.com you can sign up as a you can sign up as a uh, subscriber and to have have your parcels delivered to a parcel locker of your choice and um, if you're a business interested in using our parcel lockers also there's there's some there's resources on our website for business um, and also if you're interested in hosting a locker at your at your service station or retail outlet also contact us through the website and then the other thing is i'd say is um we've got uh other you know in terms of our you know we've been talking a lot about our public parcel locker network the ones that you'll see needle stores and service stations and so on but we also have, have private use lockers that we sell into private residential developments for their own very own private use to manage parcels coming into the apartment development or so on so all of that and more is on our, our website at upod.com. Brilliant. John, thanks a million for giving me your time. That was a, a tour de force. Uh, thanks for sharing your story uh, personally and as well as the story of, of Upod. And I wish you continued growth and success. And um, yeah, uh, just more power to you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. And good luck with the podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this week's conversation. We hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard and you want to stay in touch with us, then please head over to www.belowtheline.ie to subscribe to our mailing list and to explore our upcoming programs and events. Until then, take care and see you next time.